Oh, welcome to Food Safety Day 2021, which is celebrated every year on June 7th. World Food, S food Safety Day aims to spread awareness, detect and prevent foodborne risks, contributing to food security, human health, economic prosperity, agriculture, market access, tourism, and sustainable development. Today, uh, the work that all of our participants today do is critical to food safety for their communities, nations, and the world. For today's event, we have partnered with Stop Foodborne Illness. Stop Foodborne Illness is a nonprofit organization that for over 25 years has worked with illness victims and their families to advocate for and support best practices and continuous improvement in food safety. Through Stop uh, work, illness survivors and their families called for reforms in the FSIS inspection program following the Jack in the Box outbreak in 92 and 93, and were part of the consumer industry coalition that supported and ultimately gained the enactment of FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act. In addition to constituent support and policy advocacy, STOP facilitates collaboration between illness survivors and food companies to bring personal experiences with serious illness into company training and food safety culture programs. I'm pleased to introduce my friend and AFTO member, Mitzi Baum, who is the CEO of STOP Foodborne Illness. Prior to beginning her tenure at STOP, Mitzi cultivated a 23-year career at Feeding America, beginning as network services representative and rising to the senior level position of managing director of food safety. Uh, Mitzi has extensive experience in the restaurant industry and holds a master of food safety and a certificate of food law from Michigan State University, in addition to a bachelor of science degree uh, from Bowling Green State University. With that, let's go ahead and turn today's program over to Mitzi. Thank you, Steve, and thank you so much for having me with you today on World Food Safety Day. I um, sincerely appreciate it and would like to say thank you to everyone who's listening today um, for all the work that you do every day. Um, it's so important for our food supply and um, you are the unsung hero. So thank you so much. Today, um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to discuss STOP, Foodborne Illness, with you. And we do just call ourselves STOP. And I'll quickly give, give you some background on STOP, um, why we started. Steve um, shared with you some of our historical achievements. Um, there's a few others that we've been involved in that I want to share with you as well. Uh, talk to you a little bit about the work that we're doing now. Um, our Alliance to Stop Foodborne Illness, which is a collaboration with industry. And then, of course, introduce you to today's headliner, Aaron Simmons. So Stop Foodborne Illness is a national 501c3 nonprofit public health organization. We're focused on advocacy, collaboration, and innovation to reduce and prevent foodborne illness in the United States. The Stop team is uh, small but mighty. We're comprised of um, five individuals, uh, and that includes our Dave Thino Fellow, which is an annual rotation. We've been very fortunate to have our 2020 Dave Thino Fellow stay on for an additional year due to the pandemic. Jamie Ragos, um, however, will be departing um, as a Fulbright Scholar to Taiwan midsummer. And we're excited to share that our next Dave Thino Fellow, the 2020 fil uh, Fellow, will be announced at IAFP on Sunday night, July 18th, prior to the Ivan Park Lecture. Our Board of Directors is comprised of um, a variety of folks from different areas in the food business, as well as constituent advocates or those that have been uh, personally injured due to foodborne disease or a loved one has. Um, we also have academia represented on our board, uh, retail, um, food service, and former federal um, regulatory uh, staff. So as Steve shared, um, STOP was born out of tragedy. And that was the 1993 E. coli 0157H7 outbreak due to undercooked hamburger from a, um, uh, a fast food chain. And it seems to be that E. coli was not in um, conversation at the time, and certainly not in the general consumer's language at the time until the outbreak. 
Um, over 700 people were um, affected by the undercooked hamburgers with 178 of them being permanently damaged due to consuming the hamburger. And um, the small number at the bottom of my screen is four. And that's four individuals, four children that perished. And they were all under the age of seven. As food safety professionals, we share a lot of numbers, a lot of data, 48 million illnesses annually, 128,000 hospitalizations, and 3,000 deaths. But we need to really focus on these small numbers. When we say only four died, that's four lives cut short, four families permanently altered, and four communities um, looking for answers. So these, this number on this slide, four, is the why of food safety. It's why you do your job every day to prevent fatalities and illness due to food. So some of the achievements we've had over the years, um, beginning with the HACCP rule in 1996 after the E. coli 0157H7 outbreak, um, Staff was also um, critical in getting warning labels on unpasteurized juices. And you'll see that happened in 1997. All of these items in which staff was um, participating in, unfortunately, were responses to outbreaks, illnesses, and deaths. That's why staff is here, to work with industry and regulatory agencies to prevent illness and death. Our current work is similar to what we have done previously. We're focusing on working with folks that have been injured due to foodborne illness or have lost a loved one. And with that work, we have created our new website that went live at the end of 2020, and that includes a navigational map. This map provides details of what people that have been through severe foodborne disease with a loved one or themselves wish they had had to understand exactly what was coming. And I'll ask Amy if you would share the video, the intro video on the website now, please. We've been where you are now. Your journey to a dangerous place called foodborne illness may have already begun. And our families are here to walk with you step by step, to direct you through the rough patches, and to deliver you to recovery and healing. You are your child's or other family member's best advocate. And this advocacy will take on many forms in the days and weeks ahead. Right now, you've got to think like an epidemiologist, reconstructing the past days. What did she eat? Who was she with? What's making her sick? And how can you protect others in your home? Soon, you may have to act like a triage nurse. Where should we go? How can we get the best care in our community? What are the best practices for diagnosis and reporting if your path includes hospitalization, you will play a key supporting role, comforting your loved one, becoming a key partner on a team of dedicated professionals. Then, as the disease winds down, your role will shift into that of a being a shepherd, leading your loved one through the ups and downs of recovery, rehab, follow-up care, and adapting to a new landscape. Many months later, as you regain your balance and your view expands, you may do what many of us have done. You may find that your anger at a system that caused such harm compels you to take a stance. In doing so, you'll have come full circle. You'll be right back where you started, an advocate once again, but then in a larger sense using your family's experience to protect others from this dangerous landscape. But right now, you need answers, you need to find your bearings, and we believe that you'll find them in this roadmap that we've created for you.
Thank you for rolling that, Amy. I really appreciate it. And for those of you that are watching, that's the intro video. Mary Hearsink is one of our founding mothers, and she is currently on our board of directors. Mary led the work to create the navigational map. It is extensive. It has so much information for anyone that's looking for answers. I encourage you all to take a look at the navigational map on our website as a resource for you. And if you know anyone that may have um, may be struggling with foodborne illness or just wants to learn more. Additional, additionally to providing constituent services and support, we have been conducting um, a literature review to support research on the early detection of foodborne illness. We have found throughout our work is that there's very little research on early detection. And so um, we are currently looking for a grant funding to uh, continue some research to identify why it is not being studied, the um, IDSA guidelines, the Infectious Diseases Society of America, they have infectious disease guidelines, infectious, infectious diarrheal guidelines, which um, in our preliminary research shows that very few healthcare providers know of the guidance, nor do they follow it, nor do they know which um, pathogens are reportable to the health department. So we're, um, excited to find some funding so we can dig into this a little deeper because we know if foodborne illness is detected early, we can avoid severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Food safety policy is also core to STOP's history. We're currently working on um, poultry regulatory modernization. Uh, Stop Foodborne Illness, along with the Center for Science and the Public Interest, Consumer Reports, and the Consumer Federation of America filed a petition with FSIS at the beginning of 2020 to request that um, inspection for poultry be modernized, specifically identifying serotypes of salmonella that cause human illness and Campylobacter to be identified as adulterants in poultry. Uh, we do have um, a variety of constituent advocates that have signed on to this petition. And Amy, I'll ask you if you'll share the video from Amanda Creighton, please. Hi, my name is Amanda Creighton, and I signed this petition for my son, Noah. He was one of the youngest victims of the Foster Farms Salmonella Heidelberg outbreak in 2013. He was only 18 months old when the salmonella seeded in his brain. Doctors had to give him a craniotomy in order to remove very large abscesses that were killing him. We count ourselves really lucky that he survived that battle, but his journey is far from over. He's eight now, and in Noah's world, every day it's a struggle to speak. We've spent six years in intensive therapy for neurocognitive disorder, sensory motor deficits, learning disabilities, and expressive language disorder. The USDA must act to put enforceable salmonella standards in place to prevent illnesses like Noah's and death. I sign this petition because we can and we should do more. Um, we're also working on leafy greens uh, with the safety coalition. Mike Taylor, who is on our board of directors, is leading uh, the work with regard to um, how to how to overcome the chronic issues that we're having with leafy greens um, out in the salad bowl and in Yuma. And then, lastly, um, our food safety culture work is our alliance to stop foodborne illness. And this work is a collaboration with industry uh, and we're working with them to improve and strengthen their internal food safety culture practices. So you can see by this slide, we're very fortunate to have many major manufacturers, global manufacturers um, 
as well as retailers participating in this program. Um, we have 10 founding members and recently Nestle and Hershey's have joined um, the Alliance. And the work that we're currently doing with them, um, we're focusing on recall modernization and we're working, working collaboratively with AFTO as we are focused on real, uh, real modernization to the recall process. AFTO certainly has a regulatory focus and um, the working group that STOP and the Alliance has put together includes academia and a variety of different types of industry. We are looking at it from the consumer perspective and what the communications are that go out and how to create consistency between USDA and FDA and deliver a message that consumers understand and can act on. We're also working with um, FDA with regard to food safety culture piece in their new era of smarter food safety. Um, we have a tentative date to kick off our webinar series with FDA in September. Um, we're very excited about that with Mike Taylor and Frank Giannis participating in that webinar. We are currently developing a toolkit for small and medium enterprises. We acknowledge that those folks that are in our alliance have, they have a lot of monetary and human resources to put at food safety and food safety culture development, um, but smaller and medium sizes do not. So we're currently working with an internal group um, from the alliance to develop a toolkit along with um, our a senior advisor, a special advisor, Loan Jesperson from Cultivate. And then of course, how do you measure the impact that your food safety culture programs have? We're working on that with Loan as well. We have a variety of individual projects working with our Alliance members from Maple Leaf Foods. They have a food safety symposium every year, which is in October this year, where they'll be highlighting their incredible programs that they've put into place. ConAgra Foods, Amazon today for World Food Safety Day has worked with one of our constituent advocates to put out a variety of videos. Um, LGMA, the Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement, they put out a video um, about 10 years ago with two of our constituent advocates. Riley was nine when she was injured in the 2006 spinach E. coli outbreak. She's now a college graduate. We're working on updating that video. Where are they now and how did um, the food, severe foodborne disease that Riley and Lauren Bush experienced, how has that impacted their lives? And as today is World Food Safety Day, you can make a donation to any of your favorite food safety causes. I'm speaking with you today, so I have the distinct pleasure and opportunity to ask you to double your donation um, with a donation to Stop Foodborne Illness. We have been given a $100,000 challenge grant. If we reach $100,000, it doubles your donation. Any donation, any size is helpful. And with that, I'm going to turn you over to, um, to, the, to the headliner today, Erin Simmons. She's a mom and marketing professional located in Silicon Valley, specifically San Jose. She is happily married to her husband Mosby and has two boys, Trevor, who is 12, and MJ, who is 16. Trevor suffered injury from shigatoxin producing E. coli 0157H7 in January of 2017. Erin? Hi, um, can you guys see my screen or are you sharing the slides? Not yet, Erin. I thought you were going to share your slides. You're going to share my slides. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to share. There we go. Can you guys see it okay? Perfect. Awesome. Um, so um, it's, re <laughs> it's really great to be here. I really appreciate um, being able to share our story. Whoops. My son Trevor was eight years old when he was um, when he suffered, uh, an injury from E. coli, um, he, uh, he's a happy, um, really fun loving, um, unique little boy. He loves tennis. He loves Legos. He loves his brother, his cat. 
he's the youngest of our two boys and um, he is adorable. Like he is just a really, really neat kid. Um, in January, 2017, uh, we went, uh, it was uh, over the winter break. We went to um, Target, picked up a jar of our regular uh, substitute peanut butter because my oldest son was deemed allergic to peanuts. And uh, we also bought a basketball and I think probably some Legos. Went home, um, carried on our, with our day and um, uh, school started the next week, made a toasted bagel with soy nut butter um, spread on it. Trevor went to school and came, was sent home that same day about um, two and a half, three hours later with what we thought was the stomach flu. There were two or three other kids in the class that um, had been sent home too. So it was like, okay, our kid is sick, no big deal. Um, about three days later, he was not improving. He started to refuse liquids and food. And about um, another day or two after that, there was blood in his stool and he had um, nonstop vomiting and diarrhea um, 24 hours for about a week. Um, we took him, uh, I, was, I, I was shocked that um, there was blood in his stool. Uh, we immediately called the uh, emergency line um, medical provider for our doctor and they said, you know, take him to the pediatrician. So we did that same day and um, the pediatrician um, she wasn't sure what was going on. Um, she sent us home and, uh, she said, if it continues then to come back. And, and so we did. And then, uh, two days later, he was admitted to the first hospital visit. Um, and there, um, he just continued to decline. Um, it was really scary. It was, um, kind of unbelievable what was going on because we didn't know what was going on with him. Um, he was given Lasix and uh, um, Tylenol for pain. Um, there was a lot of pain. He started hallucinating. Uh, he started to puff up. His face um, became kind of like the, the Pillsbury Doughboy face. And we still didn't know what was going on. Um, the doctors weren't real um, open with us. And we still don't know why. Um, we... we uh, were introduced to a, um, a GI doctor and that GI doctor told us, you know, it looks like he isn't, he's still declining. And, um, he actually told us the next step would be to get to nephrology to a, a kidney specialist. Um, but we still didn't know what had sickened him and we still didn't know, um, you know, what the diagnosis was or what was the prognosis. Um, so it was all very scary. Um, I started searching on the internet for, with symptoms and I came across um, a lot of content from uh, who was, uh, who uh, became our lawyer, Bill Marler. And um, I didn't find any, um, um, anything helpful. I found a lot of scary stuff. Like, you know, you, everybody tells you don't search on the internet when your kid is sick because you find stuff that's just like unbelievable, right? But I did find um, the diagnosis for HUS and I was like, oh, wow, this really totally matches what my kid Trevor has. But nobody at the hospital at that first hospital was talking about HUS and it was, he was there for about uh, like four or five days. Um, he was um, uh, transferred to Lucille Packard Stanford Children's Hospital uh, to the PQ. And that's where they started talking about um, HUS. He did suffer a uh, full kidney renal failure and he was uh, put on the kidney dialysis machine for um, every day for about a week. Um, his kidneys did start to start working again. Uh, we got very good care. I would say we were extremely lucky to be in the Bay Area where we have access to great um, services and um, you know, top-notch doctors and nurses that really understand how to treat HUS. Um, he, um, we still didn't know the food source. We still didn't know. We were very concerned that we had something in our house or we weren't as parents doing a good job with Trevor or our kids. Um, we cleaned out our refrigerator. We bleached every surface. We 
we kind of went a little crazy with the cleaning because we just didn't know where it came from. Um, the one thing that we didn't do though was we didn't clean out our pantry. And uh, Trevor was released from the hospital. Um, uh, he did have high blood pressure and that was being monitored daily and um, with medication to control that. Um, it was kind of a whirlwind when we got home. Um, we had a lot of media contacts um, but about two to three weeks later, um, I had received a call from the Santa Clara Health Department. Again, um, this was, this was, uh, she had, the, the gal had kept in touch with me since the first week I had received a call from her um, in the first hospital as well. And so I really, that, that it's an interesting timeline, I think, to note because by talking with the Santa Clara Health Department, they were in contact with the CDC, which I did not know. I did not know how this worked until we went through this process. Um, but she really helped me understand kind of what the process was and what was gonna go on. And um, because we didn't have any resources at that time and we weren't fully connected, we were still in, um, you know, like trauma, basically um, emergency mode. Um, so when I did get in contact with her again, um, it was kind of an amazing turn of events. She had, uh, she was in contact with the CDC and I guess other kids and other people across the United States had also shown up sick for the same bacterial source. And those matches, um, showed a commonality and she explained all that to me. So the one, there was a group of food items that were on that list. Um, I have a really hard time um, looking at these pictures. I'll just pass through them really quick. You can look at them later, but this is Trevor in different stages of his illness. Um, um, but the common, the common products, there was a small group of them. Um, the, the, the most common one and the one that was the winner, so to speak, was probably the most ironic named food brand um, like ever. Um, it was called I Am Healthy. They, this, this, this brand was created by a company called Dixie Dew, uh, located um, somewhere in Kentucky. Um, it was investigated. It was toured by um, um, a, a several important people. Um, and it, there, I did read the report and it was deemed a, dis, a disgusting, very irresponsible group of people that were producing this food product. I have no idea still to this day how this company was in business. They should not have been in business. Um, and, the, and the other important thing to note is that this is a product that is more or less targeted toward children because it is was used in daycares as a peanut butter allergy substitute food. Um, and uh, so, and it was very, it was very, um, it's a very dangerous, it was a very dangerous um, food source. Um, anyway, um, the other important thing to note too is that uh, the, the, in the beginning of the outbreak, it was a voluntary recall. My friends and family, we started posting the pictures of the food source uh, on Facebook and on social media. And we had friends and family, um, you know, two to 300 miles from us finding this product on the lucky supermarket shelf on closeout <laughs> weeks and months after the voluntary recall turned into the, the um, you know, the, the required recall. Um, it was almost like everyone knew that this is the product that sickened all these people, but yet we couldn't get the product off the shelf. And in, in fact, months later, um, one of Marler's, uh, uh, um, not, not a coworker, but a colleague, um, she was at, uh, she worked for or worked for UC Davis. I'm not sure what the connection was there with her, but she was able to order buckets of the same product on Amazon. Um, you know, months after it was deemed an official recall, and the stuff was not supposed to be on the shelf. So 
it, it just seemed like something had gone wrong or this wasn't supposed to happen. Um, and as a parent, you're like, I don't understand how other parents can still, still be, you know, finding this product. Um, we had the product in our pantry still three weeks after we got home. Um, and I just think that's super important to note because um, we could have all eaten from that jar. We took the jar to the hospital trying to entice Trevor to eat because it was his favorite food. Um, I kind of joke that that um, Doritos saved my kid's life because they were the doctors were getting in the PQ at Stanford. They were getting ready to put Trevor on um, all kinds of machines to get him, you know, to to perk him back up because he wasn't eating and, and he wasn't able to keep food down for a long period of time. Um, so, um, I, I just want to talk a little bit about, um, how Trevor is doing now and kind of close out, um, Trevor, he, he's 12 now. He is, um, still happy for the most part, but he has a really high level of fear of food. Uh, he has OCD behaviors around food. He has certain foods that he will eat and he won't try new things like, like normal kids do. He does have a higher level of anxiety of, of the average kid. Things do stress him out more than the average. Um, he has uh, ongoing therapist work. Um, he's, we've tried different types of therapy like brain spotting and um, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, uh, he's lack of stamina. He's, he gets tired very easily. He has nightmares and insomnia, you know, all of the normal things that I think kids that go through trauma have. Um, it wasn't just Trevor that was affected. It was our whole family. My oldest son who was, um, uh, 12, 11, uh, 12 at the time, um, you know, he had issues with, with thinking that we deserted him for a month while he was in the hospital um, and, and, and stuff like that. So, um, he's doing, Trevor is doing much better now. I think as he grows, as long as his kidneys continue to grow with him, the doctors are at nephrology up at Stanford are telling us that he should be okay. They don't know what underlying damage he has. They don't know the long-term effects of HUS. Um, they're optimistic, but we are still, uh, monitoring him um, every year for, for kidney damage. Um, and that will be a lifelong journey for, for Trevor. Um, uh, I wish that the recall, um, I, again, the product should never have been on the shelf. I still don't understand how this company was able to get through whatever screening processes or, or regulatory processes or inspections or whatever. Like I don't, I still, as a parent, don't really understand how that works. Um, so there is anger there for me. Um, I, I think that as a parent, um, it's important for others to know that, you know, we're consumers. Um, we need to trust, we need to trust what we buy on the shelf. We need to be able to go to the grocery store and, and not be afraid of what we buy. Um, we, we need to understand that when you hear, when we hear things that aren't safe, like I'm, I don't want to bad mouth anybody here, but you know, like I still have parent friends that buy food from places that, that have, you know, have had lots of issues. Um, I don't understand that mentality. Um, I, I think that, that we need to, as parents and consumers, we need to put our, our money where our mouth is, so to speak. And if we want our environment and our kids to be safe and, and be able to buy um, say food, we need to act, we need to talk about it. And, and we need to, to buy those things that, you know, we've invested, we have to investigate our food sources. We have to do a little bit more homework, I think, um, before we just go to the grocery store and just, just buy anything, because I think that's the, the state of the, the world. And, 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 you know, that's my opinion, but, um, it's, it's super important that, that, food safety is upheld. Um, it's super duper important to, um, moms with, with these little kids that, you know, they're, they don't know, and they're trusting their parents. Um, we need to be able to trust the food that we buy and, 
we need to be able to um, trust that the, the regulation system and um, all of those filters and things that are put in place, you know, actually work. Um, so I, again, I really appreciate STOP and for the work that they're doing. Um, I think it's super important that, that we have a system that when people get caught up in it and um, something happens like this, that we can find a place that um, gives us support and the ability to, you know, bond together and, and, and make the system work better. So I really appreciate being here and allowing um, the opportunity to speak today. And, that, and that's all I have. Well, thank you very, very much, Erin, for sharing your story. I know all, all of our participants appreciate that. Uh, Mitzi, any closing comments that you'd like to make? Well, thank you to everybody that attended today. And certainly thank you, Erin, for sharing your story. I know that um, it has to be very emotional to share, but it's important for us all to understand that uh, we're all in this together, that we all have to eat to survive. It can happen to any of us. And prevention is number one. So again, I'd like to thank everybody that is listening today for their, their work every day to make sure that our food supply is safe. And thank you, Steve and Amy um, and Brenda for inviting us to, to speak with you today. One other thing, Mitzi, just so you know, later today, you'll be receiving a $500 contribution of, uh, on behalf of AFTO and its members. Thank you so much. That's, wow, thank you. You're welcome. I really Mitzi. appreciate that. Thank you both for participating. And uh, once again, uh, we should also mention this is food, World Food Safety Day and the work that all of you do across the country is very important. And we so appreciate all you do every day. So thank you all. Thank you, Mitzi and Aaron again. Uh, and uh, once again, this uh, we appreciate your participation today. <laughs>